church that actually praises Jesus, right? Amen. Even everything that we've done, we still come in to worship God, haven't we? Okay? Can I see some hands and say, you know, I came to worship Jesus. Okay. Amen. Just want to make sure. I wasn't sure. But God is still good, and we're going to bring the word. So what I'd like to do this morning is just do a short introduction as we bring this play and this message that's in this play. The title of the play this morning is called Christmas Without the Periwinkles. Uh, Periwinkle family is going to be joining us here in just a moment. Uh, but Christmas Without the Periwinkles this morning. Let me give you just a short introduction, and we're going to go ahead and have the lights turned off. Uh, if you want to go ahead and do that for me right now, that would be great. Uh, and we can get the lights right over here. Christmas Without the Periwinkles. See, this is the background of the Periwinkles. The Periwinkles are a tired family. Uh, they are tired of the Christmas routine. Every year, it's the same thing with the Periwinkles. Shopping in crowded stores and long lines. Family gatherings that turn into family squabbles and unmet expectations. And year after year, they wait on Christmas morning to open their presents with the expectation that the newest gadget or smartphone will be wrapped with a red bow and will make that Christmas the best Christmas ever. Now only to be disappointed when the new gadgets lose their luster and excitement of getting the newest I what other has faded away. And every year it is the same thing. This year the Periwinkles are going to join us. And you're going to see that they feel what many people feel every Christmas year, every season around this time. Something in their hearts and each year they find it's empty. Kind of like an unwrapped Christmas box that's left over under the Christmas tree. Or a dried out leftover Thanksgiving turkey at the end of the meal. This year, we're going to join the Periwinkles to see if this will be the year that they discover what has been missing in their Christmas season for all these years. So let's go ahead and join the Periwinkles this morning. Save 
prayers and sing the calls come to you now.
see what's going on. Ooh, I don't think that's a good idea. Uh, sure, why not? We can stretch our legs if he's listening to Christmas music all the time. <laughs> well, then, that traffic goes on for miles and miles and miles. Yeah, it does. This is going to... We're so far behind the schedule, we're never going to make it on time.
I would write this one down. Uh, if you would title the sermon is uh, Christmas without Jesus. Christmas without Jesus. John chapter 3. And what I'm going to do here this morning is uh, give some text to talk about not just this Christmas season. Uh, you may be coming to church for multiple years. You might be uh, raised in the church and you've heard Christmas sermon after Christmas sermon after Christmas sermon. Or you might just be visiting with family or friends. Or, but what I'd like to do, and it's not the same old sermon that talks about, okay, well, we need to know the reason for the season. But what I would like to do is I would like you to hear the scriptures that I'm going to read this morning. And take a glimpse of who really is Jesus, who he is in our lives, who he is in this world, and what he's come to do for all of us. Christmas without Jesus. And just the thought of it, if you have, just the thought of it, Christmas without Jesus. What would Christmas be without Jesus? Jesus would be just like a holiday, wouldn't it? How many of you know that it's just like stepping into the stores as we're going about our shopping and getting prepared for family members? Can you feel the void in Christmas that there really is no Jesus anymore in Christmas? How many of you can feel that this morning? Amen. It just seems as though we've gotten around to a holiday or a time of season where it's uh, capitalized upon giving and family and things. But as a church and those who have come to Jesus and know Jesus, Christmas is a whole lot more than that. John chapter, John chapter 3, verses 3 through 5, if you read with me, it's where Jesus is talking to the Pharisee. When Jesus talks to the Pharisee by the name of Nicodemus, he's talking about... Uh, something that may not be understandable in the world's eyes. But let me go ahead and read it for you. John chapter 3, verses 3 through 5. There's a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, the ruler of the Jews. And this man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher coming from God, for no one can do the signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus turns and says this to Nicodemus, says, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. In that verse alone, Jesus gives a presupposition, he proposes or presupposition that there is something else beyond this world. There's something else that can be attained or lived in besides the things that we see. There's a world outside of Walmart. Amen? There's a world outside of internet shopping. There's a world outside of the snowstorms. There's a world outside of even this building and this place we gather. Jesus gives us an indication that unless one is born again, you cannot see that place or that kingdom, he calls it. And Nicodemus turns to Jesus and says, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus said, most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Now, I don't know how, about some of you, but when he gives the indication that how, how can I be born again? Can I, can I re-enter my mother's womb? There's some ages that I have. If I go back, I don't want to be 12 years old anymore, though I loved it. And those of you who are 12 or 13, I don't want to be 20 again. I made enough mistakes. How many don't know that? How many know that? You know, I don't want to go back. Now, if I know what I know now and I can go back to 20, that might be a little bit different. But the fact is, is that I don't want to go back to certain ages because I made a fool of myself in those cases. So I don't want to go through a second birth, so to speak. But I want to come into something else that's not of this world. To be born into this world again would be to go through its ups and its lows, to experience loss and to experience joy and experience all those things. But I want to come into a kingdom where I don't have to lose any loved ones anymore. I can be with them forever. How many, how many would say amen? amen? I want to come into a kingdom where I'm not having to sit by someone's bedside and I can see them as Jesus did with the young girl Tabitha and said, rise again. I want to be in a kingdom which lasts forever. Now Jesus makes a point regarding this kingdom or new kingdom and how we can actually live in this kingdom. And he's telling Nicodemus, but Nicodemus doesn't understand but Jesus says, you know, it's a lot like this. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, but that which is born of the spirit is spirit. When Jesus came to this earth in a bodily form, born as a baby, it wasn't in his mind just to come so that we could celebrate 2,000 years later a form of Christmas season holiday and cheer, which is beautiful. He wasn't born in a manger so that we could hang wreaths 
or we can put the lights out, even though that is beautiful, even though we can decorate. Jesus wasn't thinking about any of that. Jesus came to this earth for something else. He came for someone else, and he came for me. And he came to bring me into a different kingdom, and that kingdom he wanted to bring me into was nothing like this world that I have been living in since I was when I got to age 26 and I'm living now. So when Jesus is talking about this to Nicodemus, Nicodemus doesn't understand. I want to say to you this morning, realizing that Jesus came into this world to give you and I a brand new birth. Something to bring us into a completely different world. A different kingdom that operates differently than we know in this world. How many would say amen? amen. A new birth means that Jesus came in the body in the flesh as a baby, grew to be a man, offered himself as a sacrifice, but he had me in mind so that I could be what is called born again. Now, born again isn't something that I just say that I am. Being born again is something that happened to me by the power of God that I cannot explain but is a mystery. And all of those who know what it means to be born into a new life and a new creation and have the experience of the conviction and the power of the Holy Spirit to come upon you would shout amen. amen. And hallelujah. hallelujah. So now I know all these years when I was younger and growing up and I went to Catholic church, I was an altar boy. And I remember all those services that we have, all the masses we go to in the midnight mass. The beauty of the sanctuary. I would remember all of the words and the liturgical statements that would be said and the priest would go by that. All of that. I remember that vividly as a child. But what I don't remember is actually having an encounter with God and the Holy Spirit. So I was living in a world which we can bring into this, this, uh, this uh, house or this place or tabernacle or building. But without coming into the, the house of God, then you really don't know what it means to be born again. And to be born again is by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now Jesus thought of that when he came. How am I going to get Diane? How am I going to Bob? How am I going to reach out to, to so-and-so and sister so-and-so? Because Jesus came for one purpose, and that is to redeem all creation back into his kingdom. So that we can be made brand new and a new creation. Now I remember the day that Jesus came in and gave me that new birth. The very thing he came to earth. And I remember how it affected me. I turned away from the things that I didn't want and I went after Jesus. I wasn't raised supposedly, let's say I was born and raised in the Catholic church or raised going to mass. But I wasn't raised where church was something that was important, nor did I understand much about God. But if you were to ask me about God, I would know. Everyone loves God. Everyone wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. Amen? Amen. And if they ask someone, do you know God, do you love God? The first question you have is, oh yeah, I know God, I love God. I remember when I asked someone if they would be interested in talking about Jesus. Oh, I already asked Jesus when I was five years old. But the interesting thing about it is, is there was no peace, there was no joy, there was no life, there was no change, nothing that happened in their life that they could look back to. All they did was ask and respond to a specific question that would keep them from a place they didn't want to go. But they never knew it. And I remember when I was younger, probably about the age of 22, as I was bringing back a bunch of beer cans with my buddy to a grocery store. Can you imagine that? Your pastor up here talking about of beer cans, and I've got a lifestyle that I was living before God, and some of you had known the same thing, amen? amen? Some of you know what type of lifestyle, and I commend those who never, ever went into the world that were raised in the church, and the young people, I commend you, if your lips have never touched a sip of alcohol, or you've never done those things, I commend you for that. I was weak, but I commend you, keep going for Jesus. But I remember a time when I didn't and I remember someone coming up to me and asking me, are you a Christian? And I remember saying to them, yes, I'm a Christian. Now, what does that mean? So he says, well, would you like to join our Bible study? Well, I never heard of a Bible study. How many of you study the Bible? How many of us read the Bible? Well, I was raised in the church where we never read the Bible. I didn't even own a Bible. So to me, that was foreign. But I told the person that, of course I'm a Christian. 
I'm a Christian because of why? Because my father took me to church? Was I a Christian because I, when I was young I was confirmed or I went through catechism? Was I a Christian because I do know God, I do love God, I don't hate God? Why was I a Christian? But I said, sure, I, I'm a Christian. And then I got so scared in my heart for saying that, that my knees began to knock. And I said to the person, do you, he, goes, he goes, do you go to church? I said, yeah, I go to church. And I thought to myself, I haven't been to church in about two years. And I remember it was probably a Easter service. That's the last time I went. And when he said, do you go to church? I said, oh, yeah, I go to church. And then he says, oh, really? I said, yeah. And he goes, what well, nicest guy? And I go, yeah, Easter and Christmas and things, you know. Isn't that what you're supposed to do if you're a Christian? Go to church around uh, Easter or Christmas time? Right? That's a Christian. Well, I got so scared and my heart began to pound and my knees began to wobble and I just started thinking, where is my friend who has ditched me because I'm feeling a little nervous here and I don't know where he's at. So I began to look for him in the grocery store and in my shoulder. I looked over my shoulder and I'm like, where is my friend to get me out of this jam because I'm feeling the heat that someone's asking me about God and religion and I'm starting to feel what I now know is that there's the conviction of the Holy Spirit calling me back into the place he wanted me to be. So I looked over my shoulder some, some more. I, I finally went over. I looked over my shoulder looking for my friend. And when I looked over, the person was gone. He was gone. And I looked all around me. And the aisleway was so long, there was just no way. It was as if this person vanished in front of my eyes. And I don't know about uh, you, how many of you have ever had an encounter where you turn around and the person's no longer there. And they're talking to you about God. So I tell my friend, I said, this, this, this young guy came up to me and he was talking to me about going to church and reading the Bible and going to a Bible study. And he goes, he goes, Thomas, how come all, all the time that stuff, those people always come up to you? And I said, I don't know. And yet I went another year and a half to two years without even actually approaching Jesus. And I still remember that to this day. And all that time I still thought, well, I, I'm a Christian. But you can't be a Christian unless you've been born again. You can't be someone who follows Christ without the Holy Spirit. By name, by building, by anything. You cannot be unless you have received that which Jesus has come to give to you. Christmas missing Jesus is not Christmas. Living a life as a Christian without Jesus is not a Christian life. Amen. So Jesus came, and one of the things he came to do was to give us a new life in his new kingdom, which is coming for all of us to enjoy. And guess what, saints? It's free. It's free. He wants to give us a new life, a new change. In fact, Romans chapter 8, if you do have your Bibles, turn there with me. Romans chapter 8, verses 14 to 17 also gives us, again, the scripture tells us uh, about the, this new life that God wants to give to us. In, in fact, verse 14 begins like this. Paul is writing to the Romans, or the Holy Spirit's writing to us today. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of The sons or daughters of God. For as many that are led by the Spirit of God are what? Sons, and let's say this in the, in the Greek, sons and daughters of God. For as many that are led by the Spirit of God. Verse 15 says, For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself witnesses with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we have suffered with him, that we may also be glorified together. We have received the spirit of adoption. What does that mean? Does anybody know what that means? Just raise your hand. If you don't, that's okay. I want to explain. I've got one, two, three. Good. We have been received the Holy Spirit, which is telling us that we have been welcomed we have been brought in with joy and with pleasure and with all that God has into God's presence as if we have never done anything wrong in his presence at all. We've received the Holy Spirit that tells us that we can enter into the Father's house. It'd be something like this. It'd be like this. Just go across the street after church and I would like you to do something. Go across the street. 
And everyone pick a house, knock on the door, and I want you to, as soon as they open the door, just walk into the house and say, how? How are you doing today? Boy, this is an interesting house. You would be what would be considered a stranger, right? I've never met you, I don't know you, and what are you doing coming into this house? You see, we can't go into God's house or into God's presence as if He knows us or doesn't know us. We can't knock on the door, bust in and say, well, God, I'm here. You got me. Let's check this place out. Boy, this is interesting. You've got to know the one who's in that house, and that's the Father. And because we've received the Holy Spirit, we've received adoption that says, you, sister, you, brother, you are welcome in the Father's house because he has adopted you. And he has said, you, I picked you to come back into my house because of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus, he came so that we could be welcomed into the Father's house, that he would know us and we would know him. We would no longer be strangers. Amen. But see, I lived as a stranger. I told that man that I was a Christian and I lied to his face because I didn't know and understand what it meant to be a Christian. If he said, are you born again? I would have said, sure. You see what I'm saying? If he would have said that there was green cheese on the moon, I would have said, go get, let's go get some. You see, I was trying to get out of the situation without understanding what he was trying to say because I don't understand those things because I was living in the world. But when I came to Jesus, all the things in the world began to make sense. And he showed me a new kingdom and a new home and a new father. And he said, you can come into this place if you receive me and my father will receive you as well. So Christmas and the season without Jesus is not coming into the father's home. It's being a stranger in the presence of God. How many don't want to be a stranger in the presence of God? You can't even proclaim that Jesus Christ is alive, is on the throne. Has, you can't even proclaim the forgiveness of Jesus Christ for his blood without the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen? Without the Holy Spirit in us, we can't even proclaim that. Jesus has given us a new birth. He's given us a new life. And Jesus has given us a new relationship with God as well. So I, I don't like to do this, but I'm going to do this anyways. Could you repeat this with me, if you will? Or in fact, turn to someone and say, Jesus has given me a new birth. Just turn to someone and say, I just want you to put this. Now the person you just told, turn and say, how could you be born a second time through a mother's womb? No. He has given you a new birth by the Spirit of God in your spirit. And when your spirit comes alive, saints, there's like nothing in heaven that can hold you back. You shine there brighter than the stars. When Jesus came and gave my spirit life, I wish I could have found that young man in the grocery store and hugged him and embraced him and said, Man, I know what you're talking about now, brother. Now I know what you're talking about. To live in Christ is gain. To live in Jesus is everything I've ever wanted in my life. To lose this world is like nothing to me. It's like dust on the bottom of my shoes. It's like clay, Ohio clay on the bottom of my shoes. And this is what I do with that clay every time it sticks on my shoes. I just want to leave it in this world, this dirt, this world. Alcohol and drinking, I want to leave that away. I don't want that anymore. Lust over here, I'm tired of that stuff. Get that clay off of my feet. I don't want that. I want Jesus in my life. I want everything he has, to, he has to offer to me. I want God to show me, strengthen my faith. I want to believe God for miracles. I want to pray for God for miracles. I want to love like God loves. I want to have compassion like God has compassion. I want to forgive like God forgives. I want to live like Jesus is with me. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 Verses 10 through 14 give us another, another great thing that, that Jesus has brought to us. Paul's writing to the church in Corinth. And he writes in the 10th verse, he says, But God has revealed, revealed these mysteries to us through His Spirit. How many of you just love the relationship you have with the Holy Spirit? And I encourage you, I encourage you even more. Well, I don't understand what a relationship with the Holy Spirit is, is like. Well, first of all, I will tell you this. Get the things out of the world that's stopping you from having a relationship with the Holy Spirit. 
If you hear the voices of the world more than you hear the voice of the Holy Spirit, you've got a problem. And usually the things that you hear in the world is what you repeat with your mouth anyways. If the world is concerned, your mouth speaks concern. If your world speaking fear, your mouth speaking fear. What you hear from the voices of this world come out of your mouth because that's all we are, sounding boards and that megaphones for everything that's going on. But when you hear the voice of the Holy Spirit, what do you think comes out of your mouth? The words of the Holy Spirit, which are life. That's a relationship with God that Jesus gave to us. In verse, four, uh, verse 10 it says this, For the Spirit searches the deep things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of man except the spirit of man? Let me just cl clarify this as I read this. Except about the spirit of man which is in him. Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. Now Paul writes this and says, We have received not the spirit of this world, but the spirit who is from God, that we may know the things that have been freely given to us by God. These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but the Holy Spirit teaches. Comparing spiritual things and spiritual things. But this is an interesting thing that Paul writes. He says, The natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. You know, Jesus, he came to give us a new birth and also a new life. But one thing that's even greater than that is he came to give us a new relationship with God. One of the hardest things I think it's more difficult to do is when you talk to someone who's either been raised in church, who's gone through a youth group, they're adults and they got older, they're just, and they just talk about God and the Bible as if they were just regurgitating the notes that they heard in Sunday school. Oh, I know God's able to do this. Oh, I know God's like this. Well, I know God's like God is to this, God is this, and Jesus, and I know Jesus like this. But when you look into their soul, you know that there's complete emptiness. They're not standing on the word because they know the word, but it hasn't been revealed to them about the word. Because you've got to live with Jesus. You can't just hear about him. You've got to live with him. He's got to live with you. You've got things that are going to happen in your life that's going to rock your world. You better know Jesus is going to have to reveal something to you. And that's the relationship that's missing. We can talk all we want about God. In fact, we can talk about the, yesterday's experiences. But what is your relationship with Jesus right now? That's why I'm trying to learn to not say to someone, I've got some advice, well, this is what you should do, brother, this is what you should do. You know why? Because I may be able to encourage someone by saying, well, if I can encourage you, I'd say this. But I learned this. Without the relationship with the Holy Spirit, that person needs to have contact with the Holy Spirit so the Holy Spirit can tell them what they're going through in this situation to help carry them through. And I am not God. Amen? Amen. Which means this. You're not getting into heaven in the presence of Jesus on someone else's coattails. You better know him and know him and have a relationship with him. So what does Jesus do? He comes to give us something that's greater than a Christmas season. He's come to give us a new life, a new life, a new life. He's came not only to give us the new life, but he's came to give us a new relationship with God. How many can be honest this morning and say this? Sometimes I find it difficult communicating or talking with God because he doesn't talk back like my wife does or my husband does. Okay? I go have a conversation. It's like this. This is an interesting story. And just a short tidbit. And I'm going to just, I'm going to uh, pick on the fusion, the young adults in this church. How many of you know when you text somebody, you want to text back? Right? I don't know, but I see that when I say, maybe it might be an age group, maybe I'm, maybe I'm the old one here now, maybe I'm getting too old. Is it a gray here? <laughs> I feel it like now, I'm like going, you're getting all too old, man. I don't understand these young kids anymore. They're not young, they're God's precious adults, young adults. But I text and I wait, and they don't text back, and I say to them, you gotta text back. Let me know you got the text, the read receipt, just let me know. Well, God sometimes is like that. You text him, and he doesn't text you back right away. 
So you wonder, well, this isn't really communication. So what ends up happening is you stop talking to God. And when you stop talking to God, you miss what he's trying to say to you. Because God may not speak to you in a text. He may show it to you in his star or in a mountain or in an ocean. He may show you something like he did to Job. Job, did you create the oceans? Job, did you make the mountains? The circumstance you're going through, did not my son go through the same suffering that you did? Have you ever had that revelation where you realize that Jesus comes to you and says, I've suffered just as like you did. The pain you felt, I've pet, felt it. How many of you have just been comforted in your own pain knowing that Jesus went through pain? Anybody? How many know that you go through hurt and sadness and loneliness and Jesus comes and goes, I've been through sadness and loneliness. See, Jesus is everything in Christmas. The relationship, everything we have is in Jesus Christ. And he's come for that purpose. And Christmas without Jesus, even for us as believers, Christmas, Christmas without Jesus is not Christmas at all. A Christian walk without Jesus is not a Christian walk. Now Jesus comes, and maybe this, let the, this message set in your spirit, but just listen for just a moment. There's more to what Jesus came to do than just to say, well, hello, sister so-and-so. I love you. Come into the Father's kingdom. I want to give you a new born-again life. I want to give you a new relationship with God and come on into the Father's house. But there's more to it than that. Because we will picture Jesus as a baby who comes and then he dies on the cross. He comes in and he's now a picture. You ever see a picture of Jesus just ascending like this? It's like, well, that's Jesus. Well, my Bible tells me there's more to it. In fact, Paul writes in 1 Timothy verse 1, he writes this. This is a faithful saying. Now listen to this carefully. Paul says this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance. That Christ Jesus came into the world to, how many knows the scripture? This is a faithful saying. So if you want to go out those doors and someone asks you what Christmas is about, say this. Well, it's a faithful saying that Jesus came into this world to save sinners. That's as plain as it gets, right? But you only know you're a sinner by the conviction of the Holy Ghost. Now, you might know you're doing wrong and you ought not to do that. But remember, I'm not that bad, right? Come on. Before you were saved, were you saying, I'm not that bad? Come on. When the Holy Spirit came upon you, what did you do? I'm that bad. Right? I'm like a wretch. In the sight of God, I'm undone. So Paul writes and says this. Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I'm the chief. However, for this reason, I obtained mercy. That in me, first, Jesus might show all long suffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. And then Paul writes this. Now to the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, to God who alone is wise.